Hey everybody, welcome to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your girl, Jessie Mae Peluso. Thanks for listening. I appreciate you. I have gained a bunch of new fans from doing a few of my friends' podcasts. I was recently on Good For You with Whitney. Just a bunch of tomfoolery. It's ridiculous. The episode is absolutely ridiculous. I can't believe she aired it. It felt more like a conversation between her and I on a cell phone as opposed to a rotary. (laughs) Absolutely ridiculous. I also, you guys know I did Rogan and um, Sicklers and a few other podcasts. So thank you to all the new fans that came over to check out Sharp Tongue. I think you'll enjoy it. This is a grief survival guide episode. So we will be going into some darker territories, but we end lightly. It's all about finding the light through the darkness, and this episode does just that. But before we get into it, you know I like to remind you to go to your YouTube page, well, my YouTube page, but go on your YouTube and type in Jesse May Peluso and click subscribe, youtube.com forward slash Jesse May Peluso. Subscribe to the page. This is where you can watch the podcast episodes along with some other random clips that we put up and a bunch of other fun content. So go check that out on YouTube, like and subscribe. And also, don't forget the Patreon page is alive and popping. We do Weeds Day, after parties there. We do BAM, which is bong and movie. And we also do Sunday smoke sessions. Whenever I'm available and in town, those are going to be up on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash Jessie Mae Peluso and join the fun. And speaking of fun, isn't tragedy so much? I mean, when you're in it, it truly is terrible. But Sometimes you laugh at the darkness, right? Don't you ever find yourself just laughing at the most inappropriate thing? Well, we do a little bit of that in this episode. This week's guest is an actor, a producer. He's been in so many TV shows. He's been on It's Always Sunny, X-Files, The Commish. I had to mention The Commish. Throwback, if anybody remembers the show, The Commish. He's also been in movies like The Escape Room, which I loved, Little Evil, which was so good. And one of the movies where I discovered him and we became friends was Tucker and Dale versus Evil. He really opens up on this episode about his grief and growing up and dealing with a lot of body dysmorphia and eating disorders and working through that shame. So I hope you guys really enjoy this episode with the one, the only, Ontario's very own, Mr. Tyler Labine. Sharp Tongue Podcast. Beep, 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 beep. You're listening to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse May Jessie. Peluso. It's a personal look. Well, it's not really a look because it's a podcast. I'm already fucking this up. This is kind of like a verbal comedy diary, a deep look into the crevices of my mind. It's going to get dirty. You might cry. You probably laugh. Hopefully you'll laugh. The whole point is for you to laugh, but you also might cry. I talk about my family. I talk about farts. farts. I talk about love, loss comedy, how hard it is to make it in this biz. I'm a fucking professional. Each week it's something different. Sometimes I have a guest host. Sometimes it's going to be a movie companion episode. Sometimes I just ramble about the bullshit I dealt with the week before. You never know what you're going to get. It's raw, uncut, and funny. It's me. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. (laughs) I am a real American. Remember that? The whole Yes. Yes. Were you into wrestling? Yeah, but as a Canadian, I found that song particularly flummoxing. I was like, "Fuck, I can't be a, I can't be a little Hulkamaniac. I gotta, I'm Canadian." It's right. You can, are there any Canadian wrestlers? I feel like it's very anti-Canadian. Did you just? Ask, Brett are the they Hitman, all Canadian? The Hart Foundation. Hello, Brett the Hitman Hart, Owen Hart. I uh, see. I don't. I only know. I was only fans of Goldberg. Yeah, but that's okay. That's later. That's a little bit later. But um, oh, there's a there's yeah. a there's a chronology. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely chronology. Wrestlers have like a pretty short shelf life, honestly. Um, but a lot I would of imagine I would put like hockey and wrestling as the top sort of um Canadian sports that are it involve a lot of Canadians. Hockey. So were you, is Wayne Gretzky mm-hmm. a fan of yours? Are is you a Wayne, fan of his? Well, let's wait. I want I want to I want to I want to picture Wayne Gretzky in a in a, a podcast somewhere right now. Yeah. Talking about being a fan of Tyler Levine. I bet you he could be. I mean, let, let's it's be awesome. real. I did a dive on you. Not that sounded bad. <laughs> yeah, you dove on me. I dove on great. you so hard, in a in a journalistic fashion. Um, 
you've been working. Yeah, I work. Like I know you've I I know you have been doing stuff, but I didn't know to the extent of the amount of shows yeah. in movies that you have been in. It's impressive. You got to be tired. I'm the I'm the Wayne Gretzky of of Canadian, Canadian actors. <laughs> so when you put it that way, I bet Wayne is is a fan of mine. He could be a fan of yours. I know it sounds crazy to say, but I mean is that something that kind of bugs you out or have you had like a situation where yeah. someone who you've looked up to has been like, yo, I'm such a fan of yours. Really recently. And I think, you know, that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, appreciator and producer of hip hop. I think we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in my studio right now, working on some new shit, play for that, play it for you later. And um, I recently kind of on Instagram, God bless Instagram. I hate it. And I love it at the same time. I know. You're good at it. I'm not good at it. Um, I had, yeah, yeah, no shit. You just have a better ass than me. So you, right away, <laughs> right away. You're you in got, the gym. Listen. You've you got an ass up on me. So <laughs> <clears throat> I, I was, um, I was gramming. I was gramming around. And uh, Pasta News from De La Soul starts commenting on my beats that I'm posting on Instagram. And I was like, Get the fuck out of here, man. So I, I followed him, obviously. And DM'd him and he was like, yo, bro, I'm a fan of yours. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and, and we don't, we don't, we haven't like turned it into a thing, but recently, do you know who Aesop Rock is? Mm -hmm. Not Aesop Rocky, but Aesop Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like the reason I make, him and LP are like the reason I make hip hop. Like they gave a young white boy from Canada permission to be like, maybe I could do this, you know? Yeah. And uh, Aesop, Ian, and I have recently become like really good friends. He hit me up on Instagram because he's had very openly, he's had a lot of um, uh, mental, uh, uh, mental, mental health. health issues. Yeah. And um, he likes my character on New Amsterdam because I play the, you know, the, the, a the, psychiatrist. Chair of the head of psychiatry. Yeah. 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 We call it the chair of behavioral studies because it <laughs> that doesn't limit my story pool. But the, uh, <laughs> yeah. He, so he reached out to me. Or he posted something about being a fan and then I hit him up and I was like, dude, I'm like, you're like my icon. And then we started talking and then he was like, hey, man, do you want to collaborate? Do you want to like, do you want to direct and be in my next video? And I was like, yeah. And then I was like, hey, check out this beat. And he was like, I'm going to jump on that. Do you mind if I jump on that beat? So we've been like, we haven't done anything yet, but we've just started broaching the, the idea of collaborating. And this is all happened because like you, you just... You never put yourself in that scenario. You just imagine that you idolize everyone else or you're a fan of everyone else. You never think that anybody that you are a fan of could ever have possibly heard of you, you know? That's true. And I wonder if that's like an artist approach where you're, <clears throat> you know, we have to have that balance of, you know, I always call comedians and I would imagine actors and anybody really in the industry on this side of it. There's a level of uh, like a narcissistic narcissistic insecurity. I call them insecure yeah. narcissists. Yeah, I, I, I'm also a recovering alcoholic, and a big a big term in there is the ego, ego uh, the egomaniacal. No, what's the word? Egomaniacal in, is in, a good in, word. In, insecure egomaniac. Yes. Yeah. It, it, there's there's such a balance to be had. Um, I asked you before we started recording. I was like, "How deep can we go?" And you were like, "Grab a snorkel," <laughs> yeah. which isn't that deep because you still need no, air. I, I know. I realized I should have said scuba, but you I, I said snorkeling scuba. is a funnier word, and you would appreciate that. <laughs> snorkel's so much funnier. But I was like, "Okay, well, we're going to stay on the top of the." Ocean. There's an inherent funniness to the word snorkel that doesn't exist in scuba. Scuba. <laughs> I was thinking. Scuba's an acronym. It's bullshit. It 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 is bullshit. Scuba is an acronym. Such a cheat. Um, you know, I was thinking before we recorded and mm. I've been thinking the past few days, like what I wanted to talk to you about. And one yeah. of the things I'm interested in what you were going through, because so many of us went through such transformations in quarantine is what, what did quarantine look like for you going in and coming out? What was oh, some man. takeaways from that time? We're still in it, but yeah. I know you went through some transformations personally and, and physically as well. So I'm just yeah. curious as to what that was like for you. Yeah, it was intense. And, and by the way, I just always want to add one little disclaimer that like everybody went through major shit. I never want to sound like I'm like, well, check out what happened to me. Cause like everybody had, you know, it was not, it was hard for everybody. Yeah. I just want to always honor that. Um, I went home, like I was here in New York shooting season two of the show <clears throat> and we knew something was coming down the pike, you know, my now ex-wife, 
spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> she uh, she was like, yeah, this is going to fuck everything up. You better get back here. And I came back and we had a couple months. Not even we had a couple weeks, I think, of, of hanging out and being like, wow, what's going to happen uh, when this, you know, if this continues. And then everything blew up. I got I sort of got caught being a piece of shit. I had been carrying on certain dalliances on the internet and Instagram and in an unhappy marriage for a long time. And I'm not making any excuses, but I had started doing very, very uh, less than courageous things, you know, things that were starting to eat me up alive. Like I just didn't feel like I was me anymore. I didn't know how to get clear or be honest or real or anything anymore. I was just kind of like floating through space, you know? And uh, it's weird because so many things were going so well in my life you know, my career, my children, uh, everything uh, except for that. So I, I went into the, uh, the the beginning of the pandemic married. I've come out unmarried or wow. I think as, as uh, the, the kids are saying divorced. I'm a divorce. <laughs> That's the hip term. <laughs> I am untethered. Yeah. I'm untethered. <laughs> Which is a great book, by I'm, the way. I'm unencumbered. Um, I'm also heartbroken, you know, like it's been really hard. It's hard. That was my partner for 23 years. So it, it, on top of the fact that there was a lot of anger and a lot of hurt, um, there was also a lot of discovery and honesty that we had never shared before. Between the two of you? Yeah. And I joined AA. Like I had been sober for a couple of years, but I joined the program. Um, In quarantine. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I also oh. took like a hip hop beat making class, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I mean, it is it is here and there. I mean, it's it everywhere. Very much both. Yeah. But we'll get to that. Mm. So I just, yeah, the main thing that happened was I, I, it's a it's a long story. We only have an hour, but I I I had to lose my wife in order to gain like a partner, a co parent. Um, like an actual wow. friend. Like I, like she said to me at one point after I'd asked her to like, if we could work it out again. And she just kind of was like, Hey, this is how we get closer. We get a divorce. And I was like, Oh my God, you're right. And it just blew me away. Like, you know, you, you, you love somebody. I love her, but we were not a good married couple. And the lying that I had started to had started to just permeate everything for me. I was just becoming a liar. I was like, man, my, my dad's got issues with lying. And like, I just, I started to become all these things I didn't want to be. And I'm like carrying on, like, I'm a good, like holding on to that one thing. Like I'm a husband, you know, I'm a mm -hmm. husband I have this and I'm not that one thing. And I'm so many other things that I had neglected because I was clinging to that one thing. And she was too. And we've kind of let each other go in that regard. Uh, it's hard. And then, you know, so we've, we've gotten divorced. We're like, we're right at the end of getting divorced. And uh, I also, yeah, had started really working out a lot more, getting more physically kind of fit. I dove into music a lot more, making a lot more music. I, I'm sitting here rifling through records right now. Um, and I also started seeing somebody near the end of the, the like lock in, you know, um, and fell in love with somebody. And it's, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that too much because that's like a new thing. But I don't I don't do that either. I can, yeah. you got to keep a little slice for yourself. Yeah, major transformations though. Brad Pitt and I don't like to publicize our thing. You know, it's just it's, just, it's too hard. Yeah, you and BP. That's right. I yeah, heard about we that. we, yeah. we can't talk about it. We can we can move on from it. Jesse May Pitt Luso. What would you say? Je uh, perfect. On, on my Pitt Amazon Luso. packages, it says Pitt Peluso. Wow, nice. nice. I went full. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did. I <laughs> You know, it sounds like is Brad cool? cool with that? Yeah, he's cool. Oh, he's cool. He's cool. Yeah. I mean, he probably doesn't even know, but that's what makes him cool. Yeah, he's just like whatever. his lack of knowledge, yeah, his well, ignorance. Yeah. The fact that he doesn't know you're in a relationship makes it really easy. Yeah, it's so yeah. easy to be in love with somebody who doesn't know you yeah. exist. Yeah, yeah. I've been it there. sounds like you had a similar experience to me, where you let go a lot of parts of you and things that were sort of restricting you from stepping into a new chapter, you know, yeah. and, and it's so hard because the things we have to let go of aren't like these minuscule aspects of our life. They're our wife. Yeah. They're they feel like foundational pieces of you. Yeah. And it's the hardest thing to do. And also 
how you're speaking about just your accountability to yourself and your self-awareness as a man. It's so important for men to hear that. Yeah. That's the other thing I was thinking about before is also your openness to discuss your own flaws and things that you're dealing with in this society. Men maybe more so now are learning to do that, but traditionally yeah. it hasn't been a conversation. And I'm wondering, is that something that you've learned through like therapy or is it just how you've been? How have you come to be so comfortable with your accountability and self-awareness? For the listeners at home, Tyler has a knowing nod. There's a knowing <laughs> nod. Tyler goes silent for a while, nodding. And then a slight 4-4 four, four beat kicks in in the background. Tyler leans into the camera. Um, I, um, I, so none of that was modeled for me. You know, I don't think it was modeled for many dudes my age. Like my dad literally said things like, like a man has to have secrets, you know, like to like a 10 year old boy, like you don't tell your wife things. Sounds you know? like the beginning of Mad Men. Oh my God. It's like, it, yeah, like the only thing missing was my dad didn't have like a glass of scotch in his hand. He was a compulsive gambler instead. So, but there was, um, there was nothing modeled for me by way of accountability. I think what I was taught was like, do anything you can until you get caught or until someone tells you not to. And then split, <laughs> you know, and then you're like, fuck it, I'm out. Uh, life hands you lemons, you say, fuck the lemons and bail, right? Yeah, so it's the American way. Mm -hmm. So I, yes, I, I had started to become that. I had started to really embody this thing that's easy to talk about. Like, I'm never going to be like my dad. Or I'm not going to, I'm not going to be like my mom or whatever your, your, your gripe is with your parents. And then all of a sudden you just are, and you have a fucking choice. You're like, okay, I can continue and do the bare minimum or even not do anything. Just say, this is me. I'm the, or I can actually genuinely pinpoint. And it was actually pretty easy to pinpoint what I had to do to change. And for me, it was accountability and it was authenticity. And the thing that I think was robbing me of life was that I was just living an inauthentic life. And I, I would hear phrases like living my best life and, and, and like people who were in love or people who are like having sex, like all this. I was like, that's fucking bullshit. It would make me mad. You know what I mean? Like, cause I just felt like, I don't know. I built up walls around it. Like it didn't exist. It was people were just like, you know, throwing shit in my face all the time, you know, but right. because yeah. I felt so robbed of the ability to be authentically present and real and honest because I spun this massive web of lies around me. And, um, you know, I didn't think I was hurting anybody. Honestly, like I didn't have like real affairs. I didn't like, but they are, they're totally real and they hurt and they create separation. And the more I sort of lean into that, the more I would get asked by friends and my family and by my, my, my wife, like, why can't, why can't you be happy? Why, why aren't you happy? You have everything, you know, but I was just like rotting. So the in inauthenticity mm -hmm. is a tough thing to carry. It's heavy. I've experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I can say is when you go through situations in life that humble the fuck out of you, yeah, you can't be anything but authentic Ooh. or you crash and burn, yeah. you know, something will come to the surface that needs the attention and it's either the anger or whatever it is, mm -hmm. the need to be real. Um, what do you think has <clears throat> contributed to you living traditionally an un inauthentic life? Why do you think yeah. that that was, an aspect of who you were and how you, and what you were putting out. <laughs> Told you we were going to go deep. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's me. I'm, I'm in the ocean. Tyler looks out the window pensively. Um. <laughs> Jesse May is pantomiming a doggy paddle. Yeah. Swimming, taking small, but broad strokes into the ocean. He said broad. I'm triggered. We're canceling him. He is an anti-feminist. <laughs> Fuck. I knew it, man. I got to avoid these things altogether. Tyler grabs his life preserver and pulls it close. <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump in now. Um, so he started. Nice. Um, the things that led to me being inauthentic are pretty predictable. You know, I, uh, I felt very rejected at a young age. I had been body shamed pretty severely by my, my parents, like not intentionally, just that I was the only kid in the family that was a little bit chubby. And uh, my dad had been given bad information, just like all of us, about what overweight means, whatever, over what weight, I don't know. But 
being obese or whatever and did some really cruel things to me. And, but then on top of that, there was a lot of mixed emotional erraticism in my family, you know, like my, my parents were, were opposite ends of the spectrum. My mom was like, couldn't, couldn't do anything wrong. I was perfect or perfection personified, which fucks with you as well, by the way. It does. And then my dad was like hard, hard on me, really hard on me. It was like, brutal was and the funny thing is he was really brutal about lying only with me not my brothers he was like he he picked up at a young age that i had a real ability to lie and i didn't know at the time that he's got an issue with lying himself i would i would put him up in that category of pathological um still doesn't know how to get honest or authentic <clears throat> and he 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 fucking nailed me about everything about my weight about honesty about asking stupid questions about being you know, and this is the eighties. He was like, you run like a, you know, I don't want to say the, the word, but a, a bag is a, a barrel of sticks. Yeah. A bundle of sticks. A bundle <clears> of sticks. <throat> a nerd um, of sticks. Was so concerned about, you know, everything that we now recognize as toxic masculinity. Um, and so I grew up from the get go feeling like, especially cause I look like this, I'm kind of a big guy and I'm, I'm, you know, I have like a, I could grow a beard by the time I was like 14. I'm sort of like, you know, <laughs> It, and I think I felt a certain pressure to be a certain type of man, you know, um, instead of just being the man that I am. And I'm unlearning that now. But it was my whole life. I led up to it. And, and there, that's not to say that every part of me is inauthentic. I, I think there are really great parts of, about me, which has taken me a while to realize as well. But yeah, it was just like it was modeled for me that you just kind of, you just, you be this way. You be this way, son, you know? And, um, yeah, and it just it was really hard for me to, to, to ever feel at ease in my own skin. And then also, let's not forget that I've chosen to be an actor with my life. Uh, I can embody a role, you know, I, and I played a lot of fucking loudmouth, gregarious, like dudes that are like the center of all the uh, attention or the brunt of all the fat jokes. And like, because I was like, hey, if I can just absorb all that, I can I can control where people look. You know, like if I get to classic, like if I can get there before you, you can't hurt me. So I'd like right. doing a lot of work over here while I was over here kind of like permutating and turning into some incomplete version of myself as a long answer. But that that's no, I mean, it's it's, <clears throat> it's it's deep. It sounds like which happens a lot with artists. You saw out roles mm -hmm. that validated what you had been taught and told about yourself, mm -hmm. which so many of us, especially, you know, our generation, I, I call us analog babies, mm -hmm. you know, the tail end of, you know, eighties, <laughs> tail end of eighties, yeah, mid nineties. I'm just kidding. Um, everyone knows how old I am. I, I think that we got a little bit of a rough deal and the further we go down in life, it gets hopefully less toxic, but from our standpoint, our parents were just dumping their stuff onto us. <laughs> yeah you know, we're in a generation now where people are really scrutinizing parenting, which can be both a hindrance and, and helpful like mm -hmm. anything in life, but we're learning more about our emotionality and, and, and what and how we speak around our children, mm -hmm. what ramifications that has down the line. And, you know, you, you've spoken openly and I've read about um, your struggles with eating disorders and body dysmorphia. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something that your father passed to you? Because I do believe that disorders like that, they flow through family like disease because I have experience yeah. with it as well. Yeah, I know. I, just from what I've read and the little I know about you. But um, yeah, I also think that trauma is it can be hereditary. I think you can, mm -hmm. you can pass down trauma. I don't know if I mean that literally. Like I don't know if it's in your DNA, but it's it's certainly programmed into you. Um, so yeah, I think my dad, I've heard him talk about himself, <clears throat> you know, or refer to himself in pictures when he was a cute little kid being like, you know, picking his body apart, you know, or, and, and I also happen to know that my, my grandfather was a very troubled man who I didn't know anything about until after he died. And my dad refuses to talk about anything. And I'm talking like the darkest of dark, like dark, dark, disturbed guy. And I don't know how much of that affected my dad. I think it had to have. There's no way. And his mom is a, it was a, a complete basket case. Mean, mean woman. And he just like, my dad's like, you know, 
in all sort of, in all fairness, did really well. Yeah, I was gonna say he probably did the best he could with that. You know, you yeah, know the yeah. fact that he wasn't a murderer. Yeah, and had three kids that he he like he loved us. Like I never felt like I was unloved. I just felt like, um, you know, picked on and con confused a little bit about why if he liked me basically. Um, but it's it's impossible to look at my dad and say like he didn't he didn't suffer some trauma. And, and really didn't know. And it's funny, you say like our parents really dumped on us. They did. But I also look at the fucking massive steps they took. Like even the fact that my dad like hugged us and like kissed us on the mouth and was like affectionate. Yeah. He didn't see any of that. His dad was hard, man. Um, worked in a fucking munitions factory. Drank 24 beers a day. You know what I mean? That's an exaggeration. But that sounds like he, a Syracuse breakfast. Yeah. yeah right. 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 Mm. Uh you're yeah, right though i mean as much as they dump <clears throat> the strides they make to yeah. fight back against their inherent trauma that has been passed yeah. to them it's you know it, it for that generation to even make those strides is massive well i think they're linked i think the dump came from the fact that they were cracking new things open and they just didn't totally there was no like there was no precedence yet you know, there was no, there's nowhere to look. There was no internet. There was, there was, you know, there was a few books on parenting, but certainly not how to parent like past a toddler. A toddler. Right. And there weren't these like uh, groups of people online where there was a community yeah. where you could feel like there were a bunch of people like you. Yeah. You had to go out in public and do that. And yeah, that for men alone, terrifying, terrifying. And yeah. just the antithesis, the antithesis of what you've been told is masculine. Yeah. And you know what we're learning about masculinity is that it needs a little femininity. Hell we both have these yeah. dual dualities to our our beings, and women just as much. Sometimes you have to tap into that masculinity so you don't get attacked in an alley. Yeah. It works for both both genders. It fucking sucks, man. <laughs> it does suck. I, I that sucks, man. It, don't worry. I'm making a whole comedy special about it, and I'm going to yeah. teach women how to survive in dark places. It'll be great. Good. We're going to save. Glad. We're going to save them all. <laughs> yeah, man. And you know, the, the, the bottom line is too, like, not to get all, you know, um, like aggrandizing here or anything, but the, the fact that men, I think it's becoming more and more apparent that we have to be accountable. And there's like a, there's a reason why this very uncomfortable movement right now Mm -hmm. hurts people so much and so many guys are like terrified it's like well that's a clear indication that like shit has been out of whack for so long and the fact that women have to walk around in a certain state of fear all the time or you know not all the time but in in a lot of 95 percent yeah in in instances and locations that don't even occur to us is like can't i can just imagine if men really sort of start to like talk about their shit and straighten out that will get so much easier too, you know? And yeah. I can only hope that by, you know, talking about the fact that we've all been raised and still, I mean, look, let's, we still get marketed like men have to eat meat, eat more yeah. meat. You know, you're going to eat a man witch and women eat like all this bullshit. Have a people. slice of kale. Yeah. 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 Like uh, anything that sort of just is like, just hits you nowadays as fucking nonsensical but is still canon in our society is like okay we got to tackle that man that that can't just be a thing that we're like well that's just how it is because it's not well you're definitely a voice for that i think your openness and your willingness to talk about your struggles especially as a man dealing with <clears throat> something that society deems quintessentially a feminine issue mm -hmm. it's like why are we genderizing mental health it doesn't yeah. help it, it, it no. totally doesn't make any sense no and it's not um it's just a it's a closed loop you know it's like this endless insanity loop and i feel like we yeah like it's just beginning to sort of crack that loop mm -hmm. like you know and and even to go one step further something that i've just recently started to talk about is like sexuality being a spectrum. We were raised, I was raised, to speak for myself, by a man who I'm pretty sure was bi curious and, wow. and, and hid it his whole life. And I'm like, I'm 99% sure. I'm not sure how thrilled my dad would be if he hears this, but he fucking won't. So who cares? 
I'm um, only sending this to him. Though. Okay, good. I did good. not preface that His name clearly. Is Doug Labine. Um, he lives part time in the keys you'll find him you'll figure i will out. be in the keys in november and i will be oh, sending this to him directly I'll send, I'll send him your way actually you don't have to do any other work i'll get him to come to one of your shows well he would love it he'll love your material <laughs> he probably would <laughs> he would he's he's funny he's a funny dude um but he he admitted to me recently because i came to him and this is something i'm only starting to talk about like i had by curious questions and things like my whole life I was like into butt stuff. Didn't know that butt stuff was like acceptable, especially in the 80s and 90s. I was like, just like a kid putting shit in my butt, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> shaming myself deeply. Like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? Like I'm closeted or I'm, you know, but oh. I love women. I'm also like, you know, so I grew up with this very mixed message of like, like how can something that just, you just enjoy that feels good all of a sudden become tantamount to what your sexuality is. And then I started playing around with the idea of like, fluidity and then people start really you know it seems like everyone's pegging now <laughs> you know like, yeah like that shit's on the menu it's normal it Dude, should be normal it's it like it's fucking normal but you know a lot of men still my age or older and younger too i still have a hard time talking about things that are like still deemed by society as like you know gay or you know it's it's all these there's got to be a label to it that is putting you in a <clears throat> box that yeah. doesn't quite you don't fit in it no and even just sexuality like we're all talking about gender fluidity and sexual fluidity it's like that shit's real man and that is toxic that is really toxic within men you know i know women there's always this kind of like well you know women sort of they can experiment and it's you know or women can be bi or whatever but men no way you're either gay or you're straight and we now know that there are about 150,000 lanes of sexuality you know and like so I think when that starts to become more okay for dudes to be like open about the fluidity and the, and the spectrum of everything, like some of that toxic masculinity should die too. Like I'm a big proponent of like everybody's a little gay. I think like we all need to sort of just Same. like, cause then it's like, it's I love it because it's kind of poking fun at the idea of even just like putting a label on anything, but it's also true. Like I think everyone who is deathly afraid or homophobic is like, it's because it's fucking natural, man. You're afraid of your natural instinct to be curious about shit. And why? Because we've been told that it means something that it doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know? Right. I feel like religion <laughs> has definitely put its stamp on the limitations that sexuality has on a specific individual based on their gender identity. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this whole like re repentance that is associated with not living a straight and narrow sexual life, which mm -hmm. like you're saying, and I believe um, and it should be explored. Sexuality should be explored. It should be an open conversation. And mm -hmm. it's so funny. I literally have a joke in my set that I talk about this. I'm like, and I just come right out to guys. I'm like, you into butt stuff? Yeah. And, and, and they're all clamped up. Like a majority of them are clamped up. And I do I that. Do that like, <laughs> But only recently. Only so I feel for those guys. <laughs> so we'll ease you into it, which is yeah. also the way you should ease into butt stuff. You should right. literally ease into it. Yeah. I just by the end <laughs> of the of me talking about this, I know I've planted a seed. And that's my only goal is to let these guys know I know how hard society is on them to be so hard. Yeah. And that the idea that stuff in your butt makes you gay is exhausting to think okay, about because yeah. of what society has how society has labeled gayness and homosexuality mm -hmm. and how they've used it to control. Well, and, and also like, even if it does mean you're gay, right. You remove the idea that that is a failure or that's bad or some shit. Fuck it. You're gay, man. Like awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like there's so many sort of limitations put on and, and again, not to like make this, but that's the man that, that specifically is the men's struggle. I think this toxic, toxic masculinity, and, you know, authenticity, just being okay with being a little bit feminine, a little bit gay if you got to be, gay all the way if you got to be. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> whatever you are, just be it. Stop being this idea that's been painted for us of what. Well, it's exhausting to live that way. And it, it causes so much more societal toxicity when you're putting out uh, a version of yourself that you, uh, just that alone, just a version of yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously there's ways we flow through society to preserve our energy, which is fine. That's totally normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you're putting out versions of yourself, that I think creates more of a negative ripple in society 
Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk to you about was your role on New Amsterdam and sure. how you've incorporated aspects mm-hmm. of your real life mm-hmm. into that. And it was that a, a conscious creative choice or was that just a serendipitous thing that happened? No. It, and can you talk I, well, about those similarities? Yeah, I can. I can. Um, so the, it's a little bit of both. So the show had started to, by the end of season two, had started to kind of hint at the fact that my character, <clears throat> Iggy, was like maybe going through some shit. He wasn't talking about it. He'd started like uh, to process an, a, an adoption application without telling his partner on the show. So he was going to adopt a fifth kid without telling his husband that he was adopting a kid, which was like, I think, you know, a clear sign that something was wrong. And then they kind of they kind of started putting in these little quirky back burner like eating disorder ticks, ones that I had struggled with, like sniffing, like smelling food, like where you smell and then take a bite of another of something healthy, or when you chew, like, take a bite of food and then you spit it in the garbage. Like I was like, you know, those are two things: smelling and spitting are two big EDs, and um, or disordered eating anyway. And I saw that. And I kind of, I had a pretty surprisingly visceral reaction to it. I was like, fuck no, no, man. And it wasn't because I was like, I don't want to do that. I was like, I don't want you to do that and not make it mean what it means. Don't, don't put a little eating disorder in as like a little, little, just sprinkling a little peppering. Into the, yeah. <clears throat> I was like, if, if that, if this guy has ED, um, not, not erectile uh, dysfunction, but he has <laughs> eating disorder or disordered eating. Let's do it. And so I kind of went to one of our writers. Well, actually, I should give him credit. David Foster, one of our writers, was like, hey, <clears throat> excuse me. I've noticed that you you have, a, you have a story around this, don't you, around this kind of subject matter. And, and your reaction to it seemed like, do you want to talk to me about it? And I was like, yeah. And he's a, he's a doctor, actually. And uh, What kind of doctor? He, I, I can never remember. A, he An erectile did, dysfunction he did, doctor. Yeah, he did ED, both of them, both yep. EDs. Um, he's helped me a great deal <laughs> with eating disorders and erectile with your disorder. dick and your cake. Clear. Yeah, your dick yeah. cake. Yeah, my dick cake. I have my dick cake and I eat it too. Um, <clears throat> so he offered, he invited me to like share with him, and I did. And he took what I told him about my upbringing and experience with with disordered eating, and and uh, and he was like, "I'm going to bring this to David Schulner, our showrunner, and see what he thinks about." incorporating that <clears throat> and at the time i was like cool never happened it'll be you know it'll come and go and then i got a phone call from another one of our executive producers and our one of our writers and a longtime colleague of mine named sean cassidy and he was like hey man do you mind if i have a co- conversation with you and we record your phone call right now and i'm gonna like take down some of this stuff. i think we really want to use your story for like a whole season arc I just got like, chills. Yeah, it for season been three. So difficult. And I was like, "What?" <laughs> like, so talk about like. <clears throat> it seemed like it was blowing up in my face. You know, I was like, "Fuck, man, I want to," but like, holy shit, my parents are fans of this show. Like, I don't know how to. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with putting that much, but I did it. I just did it without thinking about it. I told him, <clears throat> excuse me, what I hadn't really spoken about much, which included the suicide attempt when I was 13, and like the shirtless pictures in the basement that my dad would take of me and all these things that were like really shameful and hard for me to talk about. And he took it down. I was like, okay, we're going to use what we can. Are you okay with that? And I kind of gave them <clears throat> carte blanche. I gave them freedom to use it. And then I read the like second episode of season. No, it was like one of the last episodes of season two that ended up being part of season three because of COVID they had to like, <clears throat> they had to like cannibalize one of the episodes. Anyway, and I read it and I like freaked out. I was on set and I read it and I like threw the script on the ground. I, I thought I was gonna have a panic attack because when you tell your story to yourself and to your friends, <clears throat> excuse me, your entire life and you frame it a certain way, but you see it written on a page in like story, classic script storytelling format. I was like, that sounds so fucking bad. I was like, if, if I was just reading that, I'd be like, that poor son of a bitch. Oh, my God. And so I freaked out. And I was like, I don't think I can do this. And uh, I talked to Janet Montgomery, my co-star, who I was going to be doing all the scenes with. And she was like, no, you have to. You have to. I mean, I'm getting uncomfortable talking about it right now. Um, she was like, if you're terrified of it, like, you're, hold- that you're holding on to all of that. 
Yes. You got to do it, man. So I called them and I was like, okay, I'm okay with it. Let's do it. And it was some of the most breakthrough-y, this is not to get too actory, but it was like, fuck, man. It was huge. It was a huge I mean, that's catharsis. Pure, it was extremely cathartic, I'm sure. Like on a different level that previous jobs, <laughs> you know, it, it probably didn't even, it probably was off the charts when it came to that. And it was huge. It, you you have to know, and this is not me blowing smoke up your ass because, you know, being raised by a man who also had problems talking about his difficult past. And my grandfather was equally a, a, a tormented man and tormenting man and had two families at once. And my dad had yeah. to bear that secret. So I know what it was like to be raised by somebody like that and, and what those parental techniques, how they can affect you. But you have to know how important it is for you, just your burly Canadian mm -hmm. aesthetic to talk that, that paired with what you've been through your struggles, how your father raised you and your willingness to be open about it. It's so fucking important. It's like an antidote to toxic masculinity. It really yeah. is in, in the fact that you were open enough to put that into a, a, a show, especially a very successful show that has a lot of eyes on it. Mm -hmm. You're, you're literally moving the needle by sharing your trauma and your grief and, and being uh, available in that sense and being so vulnerable like that. So I want to thank you for that because wow. you're, what, you're creating what? less assholes is basically. <laughs> yeah. Point. Well, you know, good. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm really choking on something. Maybe it's emotions. It could be oh, your emotions. It is a tell of mine. When I start clearing my throat all the time, I'm like, I'm feeling something. Um, Do you need water? You can take a break. I, I'm okay. Want. I'm okay. Okay. I just uh, thank you for saying that. That really. It's heavy. I, it's heavy really shit. Pressure. Well, it is, and it's it's interesting to think about. You you said moving the needle, and there are things that have moved the needle in my life. You know that I've seen or we've been allowed to to preview on screen or through music that just like, again, you never picture that you are going to have any, you're never going to be one of those people. You're never going to touch people that way. Even if what we do is all we're trying to do is touch people or say something, <clears throat> you can't really picture yourself being, being that person to somebody. But as soon as we tackled these issues about weight and body shaming and, and, and uh, ED and everybody that I knew all the men I knew reached out to me right away. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so stoked that you've said something like, like, it's just not done. It's just not talked not. about. We just don't. And that's, that's weird. That's a weird omission to make in society. And I think I've recognized since tackling this subject matter, the importance of it. And I think to a degree I have, I have work to do around <clears throat> understanding the importance of it and the responsibility of it. Like, I still feel like I just kind of say stuff and it's like, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with me, but like I, that really represented a lot of people. And a lot of people were really, 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 really relieved and touched. And like you were saying that we can go on the internet and find forums and things, not on that, not so much. There's not that much out there. And this was like a Especially big, Especially like talk. in a, in a show. <laughs> yeah. In that sort of format, there isn't, yeah. it's like clinical. <laughs> Yeah. And it's hard to believe, it's hard to believe that that doesn't, that hasn't been really tackled and maybe it has, but not, not so openly. And, and our show, it's really funny that <clears throat> you mentioned like the import of it. The world health organization is honoring our show uh, at Paley Fest this year, specifically a lot of it to do with the mental health aspect of our show. Um, I mean the whole show, but they, they've mentioned specifically a couple of times about the, the mental health aspect being like such a huge, like untouched territory in pop culture. Uh, so the WHO is like doing a 75 minute panel with us in uh, mid September. Uh, yeah. September 16th, I think. So it's coming That's up. That's my birthday. <clears throat> is it really? Yeah. Well, happy birthday. This is thank you. Me. Tell the WHO. I said, thank you. This I event in my honor is amazing. <laughs> I will. We should record something. You record yes. something for me and I'll play it. Yeah, I'll get to, I'll like be backstage trying to hook it up through some weird HDMI to like Thunderbolt cable. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's cool. So like even hearing them say like, hey, you guys are making an impact. We just won the 
Hollywood Critics Association Award for the for the uh, honorary Impact Award, and we won That's best amazing. drama, best um, best cable or best uh, broadcast cable drama. Um, so the show's like it's making a difference, and I think about the shows that made a difference in my life. It's like Degrassi High, and like the, the I don't even know what that is. Yeah, it's a Canadian. Oh yeah, world. the Fresh Prince. Come no, on, the Fresh like, Prince of Bel Air. Yes, those that were like early in the sort of like the the information age about like, hey man, look, let's let's tackle an issue each week, and it's kind of buried under a laugh track and the stuff there, but like there was important shit going on. Our show's doing that, and I'm proud of that. So yeah, that's got to be very fulfilling <laughs> to actually have a show that's close to your story mm -hmm. where you're able to tell your story through your art that you've discovered mm -hmm. on the other side of, you know, whether you believe it or not, people want to say it or not. I believe it trauma leading you to your art, you know, on the other side of that, yeah. you were able to create something that's tangible. Like you also mentioned in a way that can be digested, you know, so much of the information that is available surrounding the specific type of um, mental health <laughs> topic is so clinical Mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it, not it's not, not yeah. it's not relatable. It's, it's, no. it's harder to digest. And so it's, it really is such important work and that's got to feel good as an actor. You know, um, a, a question I wanted to ask you is how have, how have your struggles with eating disorders, body dysmorphia, all the struggles that you sort of have experienced and also mm. experiencing a very youthful suicide attempt Mm -hmm. which I, if you're willing to speak about, I, I'm yeah, interested to sure. hear about that. But how have these specific struggles affected your role as a father? Oh, shit. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, there, there is a, there's an opening up that happens when you have children that you, you just, you can't describe, you can't anticipate. And it's this like unlocking of your heart, this key that just opens you up. But what no one really can explain either is that when you open that treasure trove of, you know, love, there's so much fear in there, man. There's so, there's so much, much fear. It's like fucking fear, it's bro. More, it's more than the love, you know. Like the fear is like, oh, you're like, oh shit, oh, it's all fucking falling out. And it's falling out <laughs> all over this baby. You know, that <laughs> my fear is literally leaking onto my child. And you all you can do really is like, damn it up, man. You gotta stop it. But I think the thing that I've really, again, really like <clears throat> kind of tried to embody as a, a father is transparency and authenticity. I'm flawed. I'm fearful. I have made mistakes. I'm very insecure. But I'm also awesome. You know, like I'm yeah. also a good human being. And I think I care about people a lot. And I'm funny and I'm talented and all and these things are like they've all been informed by my fear as well, you know? So I, I think it's really like, I got these tattoos after we finished that, those episodes, it says all the good and all the bad. Cause I felt like this unification of like, we try to hide our shadows so much. Mm -hmm. We try to like downplay a very integral part of who we are, which is your darkness, you know? So I think the best thing I, I've ever done as a parent and continue to do is like model my darkness as well. And I don't mean like I'm, I'm creating a dark environment. I'm being honest about the fact that I have fear and and issues. And my kids look at me and they do. My my 10-year-old daughter asks me very point blank often about her anxiety and about things that she, we've known she struggled with since she was like two and a half, you know, like having little panic attacks and things. And oh. I, my alcoholism, I don't walk, I don't walk up to my four-year-old son. I'm like, daddy's an alcoholic. But my but my eight-year-old. And my 10 year old know that I go to these meetings in the mornings and they know that I, I, I talk to other people who have problems controlling how much they drink and they know that I don't drink alcohol. And my 10 year old knows that the word alcoholic and I've talked to her about it. Cause I'm like, I don't want you to not know that. I want, I want you to know that that's a problem that I have. And I, and I want you to see the work that I'm doing to create a better me and a better environment for you. And like, also, if you feel you have issues or problems, which you do and you will, like fucking so what? Like bring them to me, bring them to people, talk about them, be open about your problems. So that's like, I'm, I'm a flawed parent, you know, like I, I, live in, I live in New York and my kids live in California, but only because I'm doing the show. Yeah, you're working. And I fly back and forth every other weekend and I'm 
you know, before the divorce, it was constant. But I, uh, yeah. So as a parent, I think a lot of the, the fear and the shit that I've really struggled with, um, you try so hard to, to, to block them from that and shield. And I just had the, an epiphany where I was like, well, that's a real disservice to, to them. Like, that's what, that's what our parents did to us. They tried to make us like deny, 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 deny. You're perfect. Your fear is, you're bigger than your fear. And you don't, you can't be fat, like be skinny because, you know, fat is bad and all this stuff. And my, my middle son is a big kid. He's not, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm like, I'm always like, I come home and he, you know, through COVID, I put on quite a bit of weight. He's like, daddy, your, your belly is so much bigger. And I was like, I know, isn't it awesome? And we like, I was like, look at this. And I like took my shirt off and was like, check this out, man. And, and he, I could just see him being like, cool. You know, like I could just see the difference right in front of me of what I was modeled and what I was choosing to very uncomfortably model for him in that moment, which is like, I'm fat. <laughs> you know I mean? like, it's cool, buddy. It's fine. Let's like be who we are. So anyway, that. And then the suicide attempt, just to steamroll into that little yeah, bit, was um it was just right at the, I think I was twelve or thirteen. <clears throat> I things had just hit a head where I was like they'd come to a head where I, I just hated everything about myself. I was just like I'm fat, I'm useless, I'm stupid, um, nobody likes me, you know, which was not the truth. Like I had friends, I was a very, I wouldn't say popular, but like funny kid who did fine. And, you know, but I, I just remember like way more than ever wanting to kill myself. I just really, really needed to be seen. We didn't talk about any of this stuff in my family. I was on like, my parents had put me on like Weight Watchers when I was nine, 10 years old. They'd send me to school with like meal replacement shakes. Um, I was forced to skip meals. I had like all kinds of weird information given to me. As a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old. So like by the time I was 13, my self-worth was completely wrapped up in my weight. Uh, like I had weigh-ins with my dad. And if I didn't, if I didn't hit a certain goal, and he, he didn't say this to me, but it, it felt like it was equal to the, how much love I was going to get, you know? <clears throat> so I really started to believe wholeheartedly by the time I was 13 that I was just kind of worthless. And uh that coupled with the fact that I think I have pretty bad anxiety and I have since I was a kid, maybe some depression. I just went to the bathroom and I, I tied a, uh, uh, my, one of my mom's pantyhose around my neck and I tied it to the shower curtain rod and I just jumped off. But you know, the shower curtain rod broke immediately and smashed on my head. And I knew it wasn't going to kill me, but I just wanted something so badly, you know, to change. And my mom came in and like, untied me and took, took me out of the shower and everything. And, and then we just didn't talk about it. Didn't tell my dad. We never really talked about it. And so wow. <clears throat> when my mom was here, when I was shooting that episode, the one that, and I left the script on the table, I left it open on the table when my mom was getting in that night and she like read the, the stuff. And I came home from shooting that scene the next day, talking about my, when my mom came in to take the shower curtain off my head. And she was like, I don't remember. She's like, I remember. I remember a shower curtain falling on you in the bathroom. And I was like, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, like, you don't remember t untying the pantyhose off, off around, around my neck and like me crying hysterically. And she was like, no, I don't. And then I just saw the like memory pop into her head and it just like oh, God, welled up you. with tears. And we've talked about it for the first time in 30 years, you know. And, and how'd she, that feel? It was crazy. crazy. It was so crazy. And we like had a really open dialogue, you know, and that that's what informed the conversation with my dad, where I called him and was just like, Hey, I deal with this. I think I can think of you as a resource rather than some reason. Yeah. Or enemy of mine, you know, or like estranged father, like you, you could possibly be the only guy who fucking gets me in the whole world. And we just don't talk about it. So I was like, Hey, here's me. And he met me there. And we talked about so many things that he'd never talked to me about before. But then the door shut. <laughs> the door was open. Well, it did, but it did open. It opened very wide. Like listen, wide. <clears throat> it, you know, it, it, if it opens once, it's going to op open again. And the yeah. more often it opens, the more you realize you just need it open, and you take it off the hinges. Yeah, like the it, door to your. Well, no, you want that one to stay shut, but you knocked it off the hinges. Yes. Yeah. 
Right. Right. Um, so that's that. That's what happened with that. And it was massive for me. It was it was very and that all informed more of my decisions to really like mean what I say when I talk about doing the work. And I've been in therapy for almost two years now. I've been in therapy for years, but I finally stopped lying to my therapist two years ago. <laughs> Got wow. a therapist and like went in and was like, I'm fucked, man. <laughs> I've been fucking lying to a therapist for seven years. Like, what am I doing on and off or whatever? And then uh, got real about all kinds of stuff. Yeah. That's impressive. Hey, I, yeah. There's something I want to ask you before we go. But before we do that, um, tons of people ask questions. You're oh, actually one of the ones that got the most amount of questions. Would you be down to answering some fan questions? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Um, <laughs> Texas Marwi 2. Would you go vegan or eat less meat? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I would just jump into veganism. I tried, I went full veg last year for about eight months, um, which was like a totally rash decision. For the I listeners watched, at home, um, Tyler <clears throat> is now snacking on dark chocolate. No, it's beef jerky. No, oh, it's beef jerky. <laughs> no, no, no. Both of which sound delicious. <laughs> it's dark chocolate with little bits of beef. You're, wait, you're answering the vegan <laughs> question. Yeah, I know. It's not beef jerky. It's dark chocolate. I'm kidding. I was being funny, Jesse. You were like, yeah. <laughs> no, it's turkey jerky. It's okay. It's not meat. It's just turkey. <laughs> it doesn't count. Birds doesn't don't count. count. Yeah. They're not alive. No, I I'm I watched that show, Game Changer, that that documentary about veganism. And I was really into, I mean, I am. I'm really into working out. And I was like, I'm gonna try that. And I went vegetarian for about eight months. And I kind of slowly went insane. Um I, I just, love meat too. I do, too, but I do also look at other people eating meat and I'm like, you're gross. So <laughs> I need to reconcile what meat means to me. I certainly need to eat less. I agree. Way. It's yeah. a tough thing to do. I was raised on it. Like literally <laughs> yeah. canned meat. We ate canned meat as kids. Salmon. Tuna. It's ingrained. Mm -hmm. um, old boy 416. <laughs> any interesting stories from Breaker High days? Uh -huh. Love Michael from Toronto. Michael. I know Michael. Um, he's such a good guy. Michael's um, great. He's got a weird thing with cats, but I like yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah. We can, we can, he can work on that. We'll work on that. Um, a funny story from Breaker High. Was that a show? I, was Breaker High a show? Yeah. It was me and Ryan Gosling. Like we in the nineties, like 95. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. We went to school on a cruise ship all over the world. Yes. Oh my God. Terrible. We were on so a, Canadian. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, it was American. It was, oh, a UPN, it was a UPN show. We were on after like Sweet Valley High. Um, Reynolds is Canadian, right? No, Gosling. It's Gosling. But he's, oh, it's Gosling. They, they both are. They're both Canadian. Canadian. I grew up with both of them. Ryan Reynolds and I know each other from Vancouver quite well. Um, <clears throat> funny stories from Breaker High. Yeah, I made a show about a kids who go to school on a boat. That goes all around the yeah. world. That's my funny Breaker High story. <laughs> That's pretty funny in of itself. Yeah. Um, Tatum Temple. As a musician, is there <laughs> always some kind of music playing in your head? Yeah. Uh, actually, there's always some kind of music playing on a speaker near me all the time. I have headphones. I, I have Sonos in every room. I'm like, I need music all the time. <clears throat> but if I had to say what music kind of like sticks in my craw, it hangs in there the most. Um, yeah, hip hop. It's usually hip hop. Something kind of elevated and intelligent uh, that has something to say. I'm I'm right there with you. Yeah, I'm, I like the I'm right there with you. Yeah. So are you a Nas or Jay Z fan? I'm Nas. I, I'm I like Jay Z, but I came around on Jay Z much later. Yeah. I thought Jay Z was a piece of shit. <laughs> Back in the day, I was like, fuck Hove. Um <clears throat> I was more of like a native tongues guy. It was always like De La, Jungle Brothers, Tribe Brand Hulk Nubian. Hulk. Remember Brand, Brand Nubian? Nubian? Yeah. I also loved like the whole dungeon family, like um Gangstar. Whole, yeah, Gangstar. Anything that DJ Premier touched, I was yep. really into LP, like Def, anything on Def Jux. So like Cannibal Ox, Aesop Rock, uh, Mr. Liff, all those dudes. Um, company Flow. Yeah. Some deep cuts there. Yeah, man. Uh, Skinner Kathy. <laughs> no question. I love him. Um, I loved. You can turn that into a question. Like, what is love? What, what is love? <laughs> that also will be in my head now for the rest of the day. I'm sorry. I know that's one okay. of those catchy ones. And everybody else listening, I apologize. I would take it out, but I kind of like the ripple effect it will have on everyone. Keep it in there. 
Um, X Tina 086. No question. Just wanted to say you're an amazing actor and I'm so excited to listen, I guess, to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll take it X Tina. Here's, here's a throwback <laughs> question to our earlier conversation. Vic Iggy 2020. What is your sexuality? Oh, well, I identify as heterosexual. Um, with some kinks. <laughs> like I like I said, it. There, there's no there's no one way to answer that, but I definitely identify as heterosexual with some kinks. That's perfect for the straight guys out there. Yeah. You better yeah, but, take that and repeat it. Yeah, like it's okay to have kinks, man. It's okay to, you know, put things in your butt. It's okay to think that men are attractive, you know. Yes. All that stuff is okay. Um <laughs> another subject related question or I guess yeah, an inquiry. Aless Alessa FC, mm -hmm. how do you honor the experiences of LGBT people in New Amsterdam? Well, I think one of the ways that we honored it the most was the way that we portray a healthy, happy couple who just happened to be gay on the show. You know, like when when I took the show, our showrunner didn't I didn't know that Iggy was going to be gay until we started shooting the pilot. And then David was like, hey, do you, I think we're going to make Iggy gay. And I was like, fucking yeah, man, let's do it. But one caveat, no episode where Iggy comes out to his coworkers or comes out to his parents. So there's like some huge ordeal where he's just, I just want him to be a happy, confident gay guy. Yeah. Like, and let's just drop it like the most casual way. And he was like, that's exactly my plan. So like we waited till episode five and just like Iggy just is like, yeah, I'm going home to, I can't wait to see Martin tonight. And that was it. Like the whole audience was like, what? Is he, is he going home to his husband? And then it was just, we were just off. And I think that just from the, the standpoint of an ally, a lifelong ally, representation is everything. Inclusivity is everything. I don't want to hang our hats on sexuality anymore. I want it to just be what it is, you know? And so I think that's all. <laughs> I want this. I want that. I think it should be more just inclusivity for everyone, you know? And I think that's what our show does really well. So, <clears throat> and, it, and to deliver it, casually as it would be in life is the most important way to change the narrative that's going on in media and yeah. news right now, where it's just these triggering words and triggering headlines where you just, it's yeah. just a drop in the, just a little drop of, I'm going to go home and see my husband. We don't need yeah. a whole, no, just keep it a conversation right. instead of like uh, <clears throat> making it a caricature. Yeah. And a lot of people had to go through very harrowing circumstances to come out to be brave enough to say who they are. I don't think you necessarily need to like recreate that over no. and over. And that's the only part of the story we tell. What about after that? What about when you become a, a, like a, a happy, well-adjusted human being who can experience love? They have a family, they have four adoptive children. Like it's, that's a beautiful thing to represent. It is. And it's, I'm not to, that's not to devalidate or lessen any of the experience of people who are struggling with coming out or that is a huge part of their story. We just don't need to, make that the, the thing that we focus on, you know? <clears throat> Jessa laid late ladies, Jesse ladies. Mm -hmm. I could use a, I could use a, a reading course here. <laughs> this is going to be an insider thing. Describe season four in three words. Um, I could give you the tagline for the season, but that's only two words. It's love heals, but in three words, um, it, is on that's, that's good it. it is on we could do a contraction there and just make it it's on but you asked for three so i don't know the answer to this so i'm really intrigued siriano fegold it looks like a bunch of just consonants and i'm gonna stick with that Not really cute photo though what does whiffed it mean oh i whiffed it what's whiffed um, it yeah whiffed like i think whiffed refers to if you're like playing a game where you're swinging any kind of bat or paddle, oh at yeah, a coming at you and you just fucking miss it by a mile, and then you pull out your shoulder. Yeah, you whiffed on it. Yeah, you whiffed it so hard. You whiffed it, man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happens in um, tennis, baseball, wiffle ball. <laughs> yeah. Dark Rebel One. What's your favorite part about filming? Um. You know, it's funny, I've had to reassess that because COVID has changed the filming experience for me so drastically. Um, I used to think it was camaraderie and tomfoolery on set. It still is. I love just being a jackass on set. But I think my main takeaway now 
is like experiential reward. Um, every day you have an option to go to work and either like just do what you do or like try something and do something a little bit different or crazy or experimental. And I think when you get to my age and my experience, like you, I could easily just go to work and just do the work and just, but I want more out of it. I want more experience. I want to take what I'm learning here and apply it to the next thing. So filming for me now has all just become this way of like unifying like my life and my rewards and my, and my creative experience and <clears throat> just like reaping as much as I can from it. I think it's so amazing sometimes when you go through life in your career and when you're on working through healing and being honest about your healing and becoming more authentic, there's these moments of synchronicity that happen. And it's been happening with me all the time, like from run-ins with people and they mentioned something that I was working on and it just reiterates I'm on a right, my path creatively mm -hmm. is on the right path. And then mm -hmm. situations like this where you've spoken on a couple of things that have rung so true for me, that being what you just are speaking about, you know, I'm experiencing the same thing within my standup. Mm -hmm. And just this past weekend, I totally deviated from my normal set and went in deep to <clears throat> grief and pain and things that I'm experiencing because when I went through everything with my father, that's when people really resonated with it. And I felt a real connectivity and a purpose. And I think when you're able to find a purpose in your art, it changes the game mm. and it, it really, it <clears throat> makes people feel heard, which you spoke a lot about where you mm. just want to be seen. So many people just want to be seen. Yeah. And by you creating things that are true to what your path was, your trauma, you're allowing other people to be seen through your art. So it's like so powerful and it's so great that you're uh, going through that now. And I feel like honored that you and I are on a similar path and it's just, it's just a cool conversation to have and such an important conversation to have. And yeah. this, this is a part mm -hmm. of our grief survival guide that I do on sharp tongue that I started to do after my mom died. And I guess my final inquiry for you. Sure. Wait, can I say one thing? Yeah. Just that like, I really admire you. I have watched you go through a lot of things, especially recently. Um, not recent, recent, but in the last, you know, couple of years. <clears throat> and just from the experience I had with you, meeting you on the first time I came on your podcast to now, I'm like, I feel like we're both very different. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Like I'm looking at you and I'm like, wow, look at this person, this fully realized human being in front of me. Not that I didn't think that before, but it's like, it's very apparent to me that you've been working on yourself. And I think it's really admirable and like it shows you, Thank seem, you. you seem really strong and great. So I appreciate that. After this, I'm going to smoke a whole blunt and probably be in a fetal position for about an hour honoring my emotions, but it's my so, path and my know, journey. I'm not even going to tell you what I'm doing after this. So let's just, you know, it's cool. You do you, I'll do me. Literally, I'm gonna go do my <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what I want to leave everybody on is how do you, what, what have you done in your life that helps you manage and cope with all these traumatic things that are essentially a form of grief? How mm -hmm. have you been able to manage your grief through all of these changes in your life and, and, and also still working? Like what, what works for you to be well, able to cope <laughs> with it? Yeah, that's a really good question. There were there were stages to that, you know, like I, I used to use drugs and alcohol really heavily. Um, humor. I really found that like if like I said before, if I can if I could like. If I could get you to look at this and control how you laugh at my pain, then I think for a long time I fooled myself into thinking I didn't feel that pain. I could like I was out in front of it or I, I learned how to harness it and use it to my advantage. Um, which, you know what, for a long time, it did work. It's so did alcohol until it became poison. And until the the humor and the and the using myself as a joke, which I always hated when comics did that, especially overweight comics, it was like, stop using your weight as a way to make people laugh at you, you know? Like, yes, you're controlling it, but I know what you're doing and it hurts. And I mean, we know, I think you and I both know about quite a few people, especially comics who've suffered really, really badly at their own hands kind of, you know, but mm -hmm. it's, um, and then it sort of transformed more recently into this authenticity, this level of acceptance. And I think the one thing that I, I can't, I can't stress enough 
is like acknowledgement is everything. Acknowledgement, not just acceptance, because that's hard. Acceptance is hard. But the beginning, just acknowledging sometimes is all you need. You just need to, to, to somebody else, you need to acknowledge a thing that is causing you a lot of pain or grief that you don't talk about. You got to acknowledge it. And man, it just sort of takes itself from there. You know, like you have to do the work, but that acknowledgement <clears throat> becomes the, that's the drug for me now. That's the thing that helps me cope is like actually coping with my grief, you know, not distracting myself, not medicating myself, but acknowledging it. And then, and then authentically moving forward from there. You know, if I make a declaration about something I want to do or how I want to tackle something, I do it. That's it. Well, I can't wait to see how your kids end up. Yeah. They're either going to be rotten hookers or, or amazing, amazing people. Can't you be an amazing hooker? Can't you be you a can. hooker with a heart? Didn't you see Pretty Woman? I think you can be. Yeah, a you can be. A, you can be. You know, I take it back. You can be an awesome hooker. Yeah. I, I hope that for your kids. <laughs> yeah, I hope. I, I'm glad. Thank you. I want my kids to be like the game. I want them to be the hookers that change the game. <laughs> Found the show title. <laughs> game changing hookers. Out on NBC this fall. Yeah, Tyler, NBC, so man. They're, they're taking all the risks lately. They so. are. Yeah, yeah. Look at them. Thank you so much. I, this honestly was one of my most favorite episodes and most uh, synchronistic. It's crazy. I I wrote down all the things that we have in, in common right now in life, yeah. but I appreciate you. We should totally be friends. Yeah, we should be better <laughs> friends than we are. We should. Uh, we'll work on it. All right. But I'm so happy you found love. Thank you for being real and as authentic as fuck on this podcast. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing you do everything, all of the things. You're Thank so you. talented. You too. You too. And uh, I'm going to go and let my heart rate come down now for a bit. Yeah, you do that. Is you it? enjoy that. You enjoy that beef jerky. Yeah. Thank you. My beef jerky dark chocolate. Um, all right, Jesse. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye.